From Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind the scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Good evening, 9 p.m. Wednesday night, Rabbi Ephraim Go. We're joined by my far better co-host, special guest this week, the one and only Rebetzin Yocheved Goldberg. And we are here to take you... Behind the Bima. Behind the Bima. Behind the Bima. Yocheved, thanks for joining me for Behind the Bima, for a fantastic uh, conversation we're going to have with Slova young Rice wolf who is an author and lecturer and expert in parenting and marriage and relationships and inspiration I'm really excited to share this conversation. But first, how are you? How was your summer? Thank God the summer was wonderful. Started out with a big simcha. Baruch Hashem. We had uh, twin grandchildren. That was pretty exciting. Was. And, uh, yes. And then we went off to Eretz Yisrael. For, uh, you went for two weeks. I went for 10 days. We brought our son with us. And we got to visit our, our married daughter there and her baby. And it was a very special trip. But I think um, what really made it special and what I'll never forget are all the special personalities that we met with. Um, it's nice to be married to a rabbi who has a lot of relationships with incredible people. And we got to the Machlis' home where we got to see them in action, preparing for their Shabbos company and hearing about what they what they do every week. And um, we met with this Rav Gamliel Rabinowitz, who was a very special, uh, special individual who gave us a lot of time and attention and focused on, uh, on us and our, our growth and where we're headed this year. It was a lot of good conversations, a lot of special people, and really will value that time. And hopefully it will get us into a good place this year where we really are. It was amazing. It was a great trip. Those conversations were incredible. We took snippets of them. There were little videos we put together last week's Behind the Bema. But each of those conversations and meetings was much longer than that little video or snippet. And just to be in the presence of great people and to watch them and learn from them, not only from their words, but their actions and who they are, and to sort of soak up their energy is, is really, really amazing. Really great people. And it was special. And the Machlis is always a highlight. We went on a Thursday night. We peeled a few... Uh, Potatoes and a few carrots contributed in a incredibly insignificant way to the enormously significant Shabbos of two to three hundred guests every single Shabbos. And then we went back on Friday night after our meal. We walked over and witnessed it and saw people every corner coming out of the apartment into the walkway. People from all walks of life and all backgrounds speaking all kinds of languages, but all who just ended up in the Machlis home, which is just this the greatest base measures of chesed in the world. And, you know, some people are a little rowdy, some people are a little intoxicated, some people are less, and watching the way of Machlis. And what's incredible is, like, to do that for once a year. Let's say once a year we say to people, host a lo- host 100 people at your home once a year. Like, you wouldn't stop talking about it the rest of your life that you do that once a year. Rabbi Machlis does it and his family. Every week, every Shabbos, every, every year for the mm-hmm. last decades, it's really, really extraordinary. And it was a, a fantastic, fantastic trip and so grateful Really, really grateful to Hashem that we were able to uh, to take that trip, and it was yeah, a lot of fun too. Also, what I what I found really incredible was also we stayed with our daughter in their apartment in Ramat Shkol, and just seeing all these young couples who are starting off their lives in Eretz Israel in Yerushalayim, learning Torah, you know, going through the daily grind of you know shopping in those makolets and you know with all the construction going on and the dirt and the dust and the you know not driving and having to rely on walking everywhere and buses and you know it's it's not an easy life but they find it so rewarding and it's a great way to start off life to be independent like that and I I loved I loved being part of that I mean we did it also we started out in Eretz Israel as well when we first got married and and those two years were really you know, they were, they were very important for us to start off that way. We weren't tied to family. We were on our own, making our way through, you know, those early, early married years and having to figure it out ourselves. And I think there's something to that, that these couples choose to uh, start off that way. I mean, not everyone does and not everyone can do it, but for the the uh, couples who do, I think it's really very, very special, very valuable. And I loved, uh, you know, seeing seeing her life up close and a lot of nachas. Agreed, agreed. I would say, as you just said, not everybody can, and, and certainly that should not be lost on people. Um, and also when you say independent starting, they're only able to do it because they have help and support and generosity. But in the physical sense, even with the help and generosity, you're 100% right. One of my takeaways from that time was also, I think both directions, it's underrated. 
for the people living there, living that life, it's underrated how blessed and privileged they are and how for generations, generations, what people would have given to be able to, when they were first married, just sit and learn with no other worries in the world. So it's underrated how grateful they should be to parents or grandparents or to Hashem or to whoever's enabling them to do that. But I think it's also sort of equally underrated from the parents' perspective or the people that think it's so easy, right? It's not a honeymoon vacation life. It's not so simple. Many of these apartments are very simple, very humble. Many of these buildings are under Tama. And like you said, there's dust everywhere. There's schlepping groceries everywhere. Noise. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of the luxuries. There's a lot that we maybe take for granted of comfort that's not as available. So there should just, the takeaways, there should be a lot of appreciation all the way around. But it was it was really fantastic and it was really great. I want to ask you, uh, before we have the privilege of, of talking to uh, Slavia, I want to ask you, Torah Umasora, the great umbrella of countless Jewish schools. So last week, this week, Many schools, yeshivas are beginning. In Florida, we begin early, earlier than elsewhere. Not as early as the public schools in Florida. That, by the way, like the second week of August, already back in school. We used to be timed with them, but we've pushed it off a little bit. But in Florida, we've been back in school already. In New York and elsewhere, many of the schools are just getting started. So in anticipation or in celebration of the beginning of a new school year, Torah Masora is running a campaign, and the campaign is called... Share Hamalos, share, not Shir Hamalos, but share Hamalos, share the Milos, share the amazing things about a teacher. So like you always do, one of your greatest qualities is praising and acknowledging and, and honoring and celebrating people who do great things. You've always been really great at that. And I saw that campaign and went on to whatever else I was doing. You saw the campaign and took a moment to write about a teacher in your life. Tell us about that teacher, what you wrote. So I, I think just, um, you know, we were talking about the summer and of course the summer always leads into the year and what's the person that comes to our mind is getting our kids off to school and uh, making sure they have a success, successful year. And really what's behind that successful year is a teacher who really cares and a teacher who puts in that time to get to know your kid and to really, um, you know, e each child in the classroom and, you know, Baruch Hashem, our schools here are growing leaps and bounds and uh, the classrooms are getting larger and there are more and more students every year. Uh, Bar Hashem Boca has become a real destination to a uh, spot to move to and to settle in and our schools are, are bursting. Um, but uh, to me, the teacher that I that I wrote about, because she really comes to my mind, I, I had a teacher in seventh grade. Her name was Mora Tova Fine. I was in TAG middle school. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away a, 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 a year a, not sure how many years ago, but she has passed away since. But she was my teacher in middle school, and um, I wrote about her. Stop right there. The fact that you remember your seventh grade teacher. There are a lot of people who don't even remember the name of their seventh grade teacher itself speaks volumes of her that she left such an impression on you. Okay, keep going. Sorry. No, what I wrote for this uh, Torah Masora project was um, Kishma Kachi. You know, you have a name like Tova Fine, <laughs> and she really personified those values. She was just good to everyone. You know, every every child, she really tried to find their greatness and tried to bring out, you know, the potential in them. And you just want to make her proud, you know, and that's really what I wrote about, about how she, um, you know, middle school and elementary school are tough years. And I was a little bit of a jokester and didn't really take myself or school so seriously. And when you have a teacher who shows that she believes in you and you want to make her proud and not because you have to do well but because as a teacher who's really bringing that out of you, that, that's, that's what she was. And I, and I remember, and I could pinpoint to seventh grade where I really turned my academic life around and just took myself more seriously. And I know that she had that patience and that kindness and, and, and cared about me, you know, took the time to, to care about me and to make me feel um, loved and special. And, and I remember she was instrumental in making me like a field day captain that year, which gave me a leadership ability in school, which also brought out certain talents and skills that I didn't even know I had. And that was a really life-changing year for me. And I could definitely pinpoint that that was the year I wanted and started to go into honors classes and wanted to do better. And, um, and, and that's really what a teacher is about. You know, I, I uh, in, we have a high school here where my girls go and I was at a parent teacher conference a few years ago and one of these daughters is not you know science is not her forte and the teacher sat with me at conferences and she said to me you know she's never going to be a scientist she's probably not going to be a mathematician you know she's not gonna this is not her love and her passion um, and I know she loves history more and she likes reading in English more and I think that's great you know so she just needs to come to class on time and she do her assignments but I'm not expecting her to to love my subject and and that's really and I 
and that's okay. I'm totally, I'm totally okay with that. And, and I, that was like, so eye opening to me. I never had a teacher who didn't feel like their subject was the most important thing. And, you know, she really felt like I want your child to grow and succeed in the area where she feels that she loves and is passionate about. And, and that's enough for me. And, you know, I just feel like when teachers care about the student and care about the success of that student and where that student is holding and what that student cares about and is passionate about and let them be, you know, and but but help nurture them in that, that to me is, is a sign of a good teacher. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of someone who really invests in your in your child, in their student, and not because of their own agenda and what they care about, but because they care about that student, each student. Um, and, and, and Maura Tova Fine was like that. She, you know, she cared about each student. And it's no surprise that Maura Tova Fine's made a name as Kalish and her brother, Rabbi Yeshua Kalish, has a community in, in the Five Towns and her nephew, Rabbi Daniel Kalish, and she has a son, Rabbi Fine also, who's a big mechanech. And I'm sure there are more members of her family who are mechanechim today and are influential um, and, and really um, inspire so many. That's a great. Yeah. It's a great example because, first of all, it's amazing that you participated in that campaign. It wasn't like you were entered into a raffle or got paid for it or it appeared in some magazine. You just wanted to pay tribute to the teacher who had a big impact on your life. So that speaks volumes about you, uh, which is really amazing. But also about this teacher that all these years later, not all these years because you're very young, but a few years later after seventh grade, um, you still remember who in seventh grade believed in you and instilled you and set you out on this, in addition to your wonderful parents and family, but a teacher in the, in the school setting who believed in you in that way is really special. So as we're starting this year, there's so much focus on the kids, right? And then everyone takes their picture of their children on their first day of school. Everybody bought them their new uniforms or wardrobe or lunchbox or backpack or new books or gets them all set up for the new year. But we should also put some focus on those teachers. Um, Rabbi Dr. Brian Galbett, uh, Allah Vashalom, my dear, dear friend and, and inspiration, once gave me a little musr. He said, I didn't see your parent-teacher conferences. And I said, yeah, not so much my thing. Yochebed goes, she represents me. She's amazing. It's hard. I can't really get there. I have conflicts. And he gave me musr and he said, you don't go to parent-teacher conferences? When do you sit and give hakar satov to your kids' teachers for all that they do? And I never thought about it in that way, that parent-teacher conference is not just a time to defend your kid or take pride in your kid or beat up your kid or beat up the teacher. But it's the moment that you can go to the teacher and just say, thank you. Thank you for giving of yourself. Thank you for devoting your energy. Thank you for going into this field that you didn't have to. So as we begin this year with a lot of hope and promise and gratitude for our Talmidim and our students, the great video came out yesterday every year of Bender, another one of my tremendous sources of inspiration of Bender giving a little kiss on the kepi. It's an amazing thing. Tough Shinpei Gimel 2023 can still kiss every child on the kepi. I'm glad that he's still doing that. Um, but he gives every kiss a little a little kiss on their on their head as they come into school the first day. And uh, obviously he can't, but he should give every teacher a kiss on the kepi too, every Rebbe, that it should be a good year and they should be successful and they should pour in their heart. So we're grateful for and thinking about all of our teachers as we start the school year. I know there are new organizations that have started to show teachers appreciation. You know, it's so important that we realize that they're really they, they are molding and shaping our children. Our kids are in their classrooms longer than their home each day, you know? So they really partner with us in molding and shaping our kids and inspiring them and putting them on a good path. And, you know, I think what's what's amazing, first of all, to show our gratitude and our Kara Satova, make sure they know how much we appreciate and how much we know the impact they have on our children. But there's such a difference in the teacher that really, you know, again, cares about the child and really gets to know them and and understands how they tick and, and what is important to them. Um, and the teacher that just stands in front of the classroom and, you know, right. just everyone's equal. Like, it's just important. Yeah. Today. I mean, there's such a diversity in a classroom, the levels of learning and the background, you know, knowledge they have and, the, you know, which kid is turns, tunes in and which kid is tuned out and to really try to make sure that you're... Um, sure honing in on each child and, and what they need and what works best. And I just want to end with one more story about a teacher. Again, I, I remember the teachers that did something unique for me, you know, like that, that really, um, there, there's a teacher that I had in high school and unfortunately she also passed away since then, Mrs. Shapiro, her, her uh, daughter lives in our community. Um, and she was my history teacher. Her son is the, is the deputy chief of staff to the mayor of New York. Right, that's my good right. Friend, Manasha. And uh, and when I was in ninth grade, <laughs> I was I'm a big I like to read, and I was reading the book Exodus, and I was in the middle of a good part, a sad part, and I was reading it under my desk in class, which I should not have done. And any teacher would have basically ticked me out of the class and said, "You're out. You know, you can't read in class." She uh, and and to the and the chutzpah was I wasn't just reading in class, but I was actually crying in class because I was up to such a sad emotional part. 
And, and she sees me crying and she goes, why don't you go and wash up and we'll talk after class. And after class, she approached me and said, what, what, what was going on? I saw that you were reading. What are you reading? I said, I'm reading Exodus. And I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't be reading in your class, but I'm just up to a really sad part. And I was probably reading on the van to school when I wanted to continue it. And she says, tell me about it. Let's talk about it. I love this book and I love this part of history and let's, let's discuss it. And, and instead of like, you know, sending me to the principal's office or giving me an F in her class for reading under my desk in class, she was so excited that I was reading a book about history is such an important part of Jewish history. And she wanted to discuss it with me. And I'll never forget that because it, it really left an impact. This is a teacher who knew that I, you know, again, I was doing the wrong thing, but she let me, you know, deal with it and, and she was just so kind about it and a great um, story. those kind of stories you just never forget when a teacher has the patience has the love has the care um, has the interest in you and you know I guess to just end this segment is it's important for our, us to show that how Kara Satov and and especially encourage our teachers to take the time to get to know their students sure. find what makes them tick and to help them grow and this should be a year for all of our children to, to and all of our grandchildren and everyone who who we know are in school this year and are on that path just to have the most successful year in every area of their growth in their lives. and Amen. And of course, it's not lost on us that there are a lot of people seeing those pictures being posted or shared of the children starting their school year who wish and long for having children of their own. And uh, we should all be sensitive not to complain about carpool or homework or school starting again and to be careful also and judicious in where we share and how we share our pride to be sensitive to those who are longing and waiting to be able to have children that they'll send off to school. And we daven for them too, that they should, their tefillah should be answered to have beautiful children who give them a lot of nachas and that they send off to the beginning of a school year. So that was a great conversation. Thank you for sharing those insights and memories of your teachers. I know that they inspired me. I'm sure they inspire others. And we're very honored and privileged to be able to welcome on someone who herself is a great source of inspiration. A privilege to welcome Slava Young Rice Wolf. Okay, what is chassid is to be joined by Rebetzin Slavi Young Rice Wolf. Thank you so much for joining us, Rebetzin. We've had the privilege of hosting you at our shul as we did your mother's Zichrona Levracha. So we've been influenced and inspired by multiple generations of your family. And we're so grateful that you've agreed to go behind the bima with us as well. Thank you so much. What a privilege it is. Thank you for inviting me today. So there's so much to talk about. As a noted and prominent author and speaker and expert on relationships and on parenting and relationships and parenting, so many are struggling, suffering, trying to navigate and figure out their way through. So let's start with that, the soul of parenting and what you think is going on in the world today and relationships, parents and children. Is it, you know, every generation seems to say that, you know, it's harder for us than it ever was before. Is it harder for us to raise children than it ever was before? I think that every, you're right, every generation does say it's harder for us. What's harder for us today is we're entering a world that we don't really know about. It's like being foreigners because we have this digital world that we've never dealt with before. So there's a disconnect that comes with that in families. And there's also a lot of stress, anxiety, pressure. We've gone through a pandemic. How do you navigate all that? You have to be able to, as I say in the book, have a sense of perseverance, of passion, to know what your goals are, and to really touch a child's soul. How do you do that? By staying connected with our children. That's really the goal that we have. How do you stay connected with each and every child in your home? And staying connected means making time. It means initiating conversation. It means how, how does one who wants to stay connected find the balance between, on the one hand, being accessible and relatable and connected, but also still creating enough of that sense that we're not a friend, we're not an equal, there's such a thing called a parent, there's such a thing called authority. You know, the Gemara Chazal understood that a person who honors their parents is they honor Hashem. And if you disrespect and dishonor your parents, you disrespect Hashem because the closest we come to being able to connect with someone responsible for our existence is our parents. So how does one on the one hand connect and be accessible, relatable, loving, friendly, and, and unconditionally loving, non-judgmental, but on the other hand saying, but there's some healthy distance, there's some healthy sense of authority. I'm still not a friend. It's such a great question. You first have to know what it means to be a parent. As a parent, what, what's my job? What's my goal to give chinuch, to guide, to inspire, to direct? 
when I do spend time with my child, if I'm on my phone, if I'm looking at my screen, that's not really time. So I think I'm spending time with this child, but I'm not creating a connection. I recently had a, a, a young girl call me. She just came home from camp and she wanted to talk to her mother. Her mother's on the phone the entire time, just looking at her screen. You can't be connected if you're looking down. There's something called eye contact. There's something about looking at somebody's face, seeing emotion. So yes, of course, there has to be derech eretz and there has to be respect. But there has to also be a respect in a relationship that when we are together, we're really connecting. I'm curious about you. I want to know who you are. I'm not coming from a judgmental place. You're my child. I love you no matter what. And then we go from there. So we don't compromise on our values. We don't compromise on our position. I'm still the parent here. I'm not your pal. But that doesn't mean that there isn't love in our home, that we don't have fun, that we don't enjoy being together. So you strike a balance. I think you're muted. Do you, do you have any tips, recommendations for people? Like you we were saying how in this generation, there's such a challenge with this. You know, when you think about previous generations, they had poverty stricken, they were persecuted. And here we're saying the biggest challenge of today is, is technology, is distraction of not giving people your undivided attention. What, what are some tips and some recommendations you could give to parents today? Because I think they are struggling so much with this. What are some things to put away your phone? Like, what, what, what do you suggest when people come to you with these questions? How to okay, best them? So the first thing I would say is, yes, put away your phone. It sounds so easy, but there has to be some sacred space and time in a family life, whether it's dinner time, picking up a child from carpool, getting up in the morning, walking through the door at the end of a day. It doesn't mean the entire night, but it does mean that when you're there, be there, be a presence in your child's life. Unfortunately, many parents look at presents and they think you buy a present, you buy something. And now we're connected. Now the child will be happy. But that's not the solution. The solution is I just, I want to have this time to spend with you. It doesn't have to be an hour. It could be 10 minutes. You can have a Rosh Chodesh time that you take a child out and you say, this is our special time together. We're going for a, a froyo. We're going, whatever it is that that child likes. Be curious about your child. What does this child enjoy? What does this child like to do? One of my sons, he loved playing hockey. And many parents are very surprised to hear that when he was growing up and he'd come home after a long day in yeshiva, guess what we did 11 o'clock at night? I was goalie on the driveway, right? I'm not a goalie, but this is what he loved. So you have to know your child. What does your child love? That's how you connect. It's not about giving a musser shoes all the time. What about the balance? What, you, you have children today who are trying to figure out who they are and who they want to be and how they connect to Torah and mitzvot. Um, you know, once upon a time, we were so busy, Yecheva just said, surviving the persecution, the pogrom. We were on the run. Today, the world is our oyster. Children, the world is open. It's inviting. It's accepting. They're exposed. Even the child who has the least access to technology, um, still knows more about what's going on in the world and has more access than, than generations who came before. And, and for many, they struggle. The, the, the daughters who don't necessarily want to dress as thneas as we'd hope, the son who doesn't want to wake up for minion or hasn't invested in learning or isn't getting davening done. And how do we navigate that balance between, on the one hand, articulating expectations, holding accountable for our values, but on the other hand, not you know doing it in such a way that we drive those children away or that they have a negative relationship with it where they feel the second I get out of here, I'm leaving it all behind. I'm out. It's definitely a very difficult balance to have. I would say that in my mind, there are the before and after parents. So the before parents from the time that a child is small, you're giving the time. You're making your Judaism relevant, your Yiddishkeit relevant, you're passionate. You're there, you're a presence in that child's life, not as a judgmental force, but as a loving force. You like to spend time together. You laugh. You don't lose that ability. 
or there's the after parent where you're going to have to clean up the mess and you're going to get the call from the principal or the teacher or wonder why your child comes home and just closes the door. You don't just subtly lose connection with a child if it's been there all along. I grew up so in, in, in a home where so many people ask, weren't your parents nervous? You were like one of the only from religious families in the whole North Woodmere, all right? When we were growing up, that's how it was. Today, every house is from. So weren't you nervous? Weren't your parents nervous? Who are your friends? We had identity. We had roots. We knew that we were coming from a home. Our parents were a presence in our lives, not a scary presence, but a loving presence. We knew who we were. We, when you have roots like that and you're strong, those roots can survive the strongest winds. So you have to give your children this presence, this identity, this feeling of being proud of who you are, this connection. Do your children see that in life? What's your Shabbos table like? What's your yant of life? I don't see this from a judgmental place, but I say it that there are times where we have to just take a step back and ask, are we growing as a family? Are we staying connected? Is everyone going into their own little corner on their own little device? Is it always the same old, same old? What's my connection to my family, to my community, to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel? For many, and I write about this in the book, it's just about going to Israel and taking a jeeping tour and going for the best, you know, shawarma and falafel. But there's so much more. These are these are the roads and, and the stones that our avos and imahos, our, our mothers and our, our fathers touched and walked upon. It's a place of holiness. It's a place where we everything that we've studied comes alive. There is a group of women that I teach. My dream was always to make our, our learning come alive. And this past spring, we took a trip to Eretz Yisrael. It was such an experience. It has nothing to do with level of religiosity or where you've come from. Everyone has an ashama, everyone has a soul. Every age, every human being, each one of us, we just have to know how to kindle the light because the spark is there. You mentioned your parents and growing up in, in your home and the legacy that you have. I mentioned that your, your mother, Zechron Lavrach of Blessed Memory, spoke at our shul several times. She was a powerhouse and, and a force. Yes. And I know uh, Yocheven has a question about uh, about your mother, about growing up in that home and, and in our generation today. I'm just, you know, I, I wonder, your mother was, was such a pioneer um, and was so unique in her time. And I wonder if you fast forward to today and the way that the society is, whether it's that women, you know, are not sure if they should be more public role or private role, if they should be at home or more professional, you know, behind the scenes or, and, and I, I just wonder what that would have been for your mom like would it have been still that you know i have this ability i have this koach i have this desire to to make such an impact i'm going for it or would she have felt more that uh i could do it in my own home or in my own small community you know i just wonder what if you could play out maybe how you feel she would be approaching this today you know or yeah or, or to add on to that in a in a world in which and, and again we don't want to be distracted by this but in a world in which there are magazines that don't include women's pictures, there are attempts in some communities to erase women's presence, would that have impacted her? Would she have pushed back against it? Would she have not cared about it? Because as Yechavet said, she was a transformational leader who had so much to offer that as long as she did it in her Sanua way, it didn't matter what the world was doing. So one thing I know about my mother that she gave me as a derech, and I've incorporated this path in my own life, before she began Hineni, she went together with my Zayda, with my grandfather, to the leaders of the Dar. She went to the leaders of our generation at the time. She went to Rev Moshe Feinstein, she went to the Satma Rav, and she went to Rev Henkin for a bracha, for a blessing, for everything that she did. My mother taught me to always have Das Torah, because if you have Das Torah, you can sleep at night. It's not about my ego. It's not about what I'm thinking. It's not, I, I don't have to second guess myself. So whether my mother began Hineni in 1973 or she would begin it now, I know her path would be the same. To always know that I have the Torah right behind me, 
right in front of me and right next to me. It's not about me. If you know it's not about you and you have that bracha, then you can reach for the stars. Her passion would have been even greater today because we are in so much danger. In the last years of my mother's life, as she was ill, she would say to me, the world is on fire and we are sleeping. I know what I see. I know where I've been. And I'm telling you, this is pre-war Europe. The world is on fire and everyone's sleeping. She would have so much passion right now to just wake up the world. In, in what ways would she, how do you think she would express that? Well, remember that when my mother began and she took Madison Square Garden in 1973, there was no social media. She filled it with thousands of people, every type of Jew that you could possibly find. She would find a way to just reach out to everybody because she truly believed that she came from a physical Holocaust, came to this country, saw a spiritual Holocaust. She had so much love for every Jew. And at the same time, we knew that we were loved. See, that's the beautiful balance, that when you are a public person, you have to be able to have your family understand that I love you and I'm here for you. At the same time, we have a responsibility to our people. That's how, how we do that. How, how is she able to accomplish that? You know, sometimes the family, <laughs> and, and that to me is, is such an accomplishment because it's so hard to balance that. You know, your kids feel you're so busy with the cloud. The cloud feels, you know, and you have a family and to yes. bring your family. I would so, love to know. So it wasn't seen as a separate entity from our lives. My parents and my grandparents were a team. That's number one. It wasn't this was my mother's dream or this was her, her organization. There was a collective feeling, whether it was the shul or whether it was Hineni. There was a team over here and we were part of the team. So Purim would come. What would Purim look like for us growing up? You know what Purim was? My parents would take out the membership list there must have been 200 families. Maybe three knew what Purim was. My grandmother would bake her Hungarian kakash cake and her cheriga. We would all pack it up together. And then my father would take the list. We would pile into his car with boxes all around us. Not about being fancy, but you have homemade, delicious, yummy goodies coming all of us were involved. We would go down the list. My father would drive us. If there was a dog that was in the house, we'd have a little argument in the car as to who would be the one to ring the bell. But this is how the conversation went. I remember I rang the bell and they'd say, who is it? I'd say, Rabbi's daughter. And they say, so nice. Why are you here? I'd say, it's Purim. Happy Purim. Purim, what's Purim? And then I had to explain what Purim was. We were a team. This, this wasn't about whether you wanted to do it or you didn't want to do it. We had this mission in this world. It gave us confidence. It gave us life. It gave us a feeling that we made a difference in this world. And it didn't matter if you were eight years old. You were a force in this world. How great is that? That's what gives a child confidence. Do you think that only rabbis can do that? Or do you think that everyone can do that in their own way? Because we have incredible lay leaders who lead all kinds of things, who can include their children in Hachnas HaSorchem and Bikr Cholim and, and leadership. So how can how can everyone involve their children as an extension of their mission? I love, I love that question because so many people say to me, well, you grew up like that, but I didn't grow up like that. Or who am I? Every single one of us has the power to touch another life. You have a neighbor, you have someone at work. There's a doctor that you meet. I, I've invited doctors that we've met through the family to come spend you know, a, a Shabbos meal with us. And they, they're so happy. They love it. There's so many people that you enc encounter in your every single day life who are just open. You give them a book that you read that's beautiful. Give them a challah. I mean, you are an ambassador in this world of Hashem, of, of your God. 
And you do that with kindness, you do it with compassion, you do it with joy, but it has to come from, from your heart and you have to feel it yourself. So when our children see that we put so much into planning trips that are out of this world, or how much time do we think about the wine or the meat that's coming into our Shabbos meals? There's so much that you could give your children to think about who will we invite to our Shabbos table? Who will we invite to our sukkah? We could have a sukkah party and invite people. Children are so open and excited when you are excited, when you are passionate, give that over. But of course, everyone can do this. It doesn't matter if you went to yeshiva or not. If you came from a home of a rav and a rabbi in Rebetzin or who knows what your parents were? You're your own person. Everybody has what to contribute to this world. We all stood at Har Sinai. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm loving this, and I and I agree with you. And I think that every family who have a mission, who have a, that goal together, if the parents are in some leadership position, or even if they just open up their homes and do chesed privately, quietly, there's always something that that the family could tap into and and together be part of something great. And it uh, doesn't have to be from a certain profession or a certain... Everyone Certainly everyone. not. You, you know, I teach such an incredible couples. Many have not grown up with, with Yiddishkeit, with Judaism, but to see the growth. And one of the projects that we did was collecting coats for children in Israel. The coats that came in, but the kids did it. It's not the parents. You could clean out your children's closet, okay? We're coming to September now. Everyone can just go and take anything that's too small and put it in a bag and ship it off. No, involve your children. They came to my house, bags and bags and bags. And the person who was shipping it off to Israel described how there are families in Israel where they have only one coat children's eyes were wide open. They're coming with like five coats each, right? And they're describing how they have to decide who gets the coat today. On one child, it's going to be up to their elbow. On the next, it's going to be hanging over their arms. It's too small, it's too big, but there's only one coat. What an appreciation now we have for what we have and how we can take just our coat and make a difference in this world. We can all do that. Involve your children, give them passion, inspire them, open their eyes. There's there's such a huge world out there. You, you spoke about the the positive of growing up a young rice, of, of your father, a prominent influential Rav, your mother, not just his partner, but a Rebetzin, really almost defining what it means to be a Rebetzin or the possibilities of being a Rebetzin, independent of her partnership. What is Not the downside, Khalil, I don't mean of your parents, but living in their shadow, as you now are a, a prominent personality, influencing yourself, inspiring yourself. I don't like the word influencer, but inspiring yourself. So what was it like being in their shadow? You know, we have uh, six daughters and, and, a little, and a little son. And I say to uh, my children all the time, so much of your life I can relate to, I can identify with. I was once young. I was once this. I was once that. I had to go to school. But being a rabbi's child, I have no idea what that's like. I can't begin to imagine what that is for you. So what was it like being the daughter of a prominent rabbi, a prominent rebbitzin, growing up, so to say, in their shadow, and now making your place in the world and your name today, um, both continuing their legacy, but also solidifying your own. Well, you know that if you're the rabbi's daughter or the rabbi's son, all eyes are on you when you come into shul. <laughs> That's it. At the same time, you really get to see what life is about. I, I think that a lot of, of what I've learned in my life, most of it really has come from growing up. I'll give you an example. We were once sitting in our living room and somebody was over, a guest. There was a phone call that one of the members of the shul, their child was in an accident. My mother told us to heal him say to him, my mother gave me to him and I was just a little girl. She said, you have to daven for this other child. The guest was over and said, now really, Rebetzin, that's too much for this child. What are you doing? It's too much. Soon she's going to cry. I will never forget my mother's response and the flash in her eyes. Some children cry for chocolate. 
other children cry for licorice or color war. My children, my children will cry for the pain of another. I never forgot that. That's what it was like growing up, where you understand that you have this mission in this world. When you say shadow, I never see it as shadow or that I have to fill my mother's footsteps because I can't possibly. She lived through the Holocaust. She lived through Bergen-Belsen. My father lost his entire family. There was a whole side of my family that was missing. But I can take what they've given me and translate it into my own life, meaning they could have sat in darkness. My grandparents, too. I was named for my great-grandmother, my Zayda, my grandfather's mother, who walked into Auschwitz. That was the last time she was seen, holding her youngest grandchild, saying the Shema. My Zaydi taught me whenever he saw me because I was named for her and he would cry. I think to myself, was my Zaydi crying because I reminded him of what he had lost? Or was my Zaydi crying because when he saw me, he saw life again and he couldn't believe he saw life again. I think there was an explosion of both in my home where there was the loss, but there was the hope. Because you are given life, you have a responsibility to give back. Yes, it begins with your home and with your family, with your children, but there's this greater community that we all are part of, whether it's here or Eretz Yisrael, to feel the pain of another, to be compassionate for another. That's what it was like growing up. I didn't grow up, thank God, going through the Holocaust, but we have our own stresses now. So I can draw upon that strength. And I feel as if my parents, my grandparents, those who came before me say, lean on me, lean on me. I will share my strength with you and now take it into your own life and share it with those that you love and everyone that you meet in your own life. It shouldn't be lost on people. Before Yishai Rebo was packing Madison Square Garden, your mother was, and that's that's really mind boggling at a time, like you said, before social media and the internet and influencers and icons, she was able to, to pack Madison Square Garden, you know, and, nice. and that's really amazing as there's such excitement for the Yishai Rebo concert there, but it, it shouldn't be lost who were the first to say we can pack an arena for Torah and, and Jewish outreach and Jewish pride. And, and that was amazing. But go, going back to what we were talking about before, not only how your mother balanced it, what she would do today, but but what about you and and the role of women today, which, you know, your Chavar to is, is complicated because there are segments of the community, the Torah community, who, who as a sort of reaction to the extreme immodesty of the world are promoting an extreme sense of, of modesty. And then there are people who are just buying into the world's immodesty and following whatever the culture is today and, and navigating that fine line between the Torah view of Tznias and modesty, not only in dress, but in personality and attitude and so on, but also understanding the strengths and the difference and the capacity to make a difference as a public personality. Give us some insight into how you navigate that and what message you have for young women who feel empowered by potential and possibility they have, but also want to remain true to our Masora and who they're meant to be, what would you say to young up and coming women uh, in terms of how they can fulfill and realize their mission, their purpose, their sense of self without abandoning or violating the boundaries of what it means to be a, a Tsanua Jewish woman? Anyone who knows sees, you know, your participation here on Behind the Bima or, or just a simple Google search will see your, you speak all over and you've been interviewed and you've participated in many places, but all in such a way that you're, you remain a, a model of Tsnias. So how do, you, how do you strike that balance and what would... What would your message be to, to young women? I do believe in the power of Jewish women from the beginning of time. And when we stood at Har Sinai, Hashem first addressed the women, Koso Marla Beis Yaakov. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that a woman is called an Akeris Habayas. There's a reason that on Rosh Hashanah, we draw upon the strength of not one, not two, but three women. If you think about it, Sarah, Hannah, and Rachel. Why? <laughs> because women have a koach. It was the women who brought us out of Mitzrayim. The men gave up. And in the future, in the future, Geula, we know too that it's the women who will bring us out. So 
women have to remain inspired. Women have to remain inspired within in order to inspire others. I always say, if you want to give oxygen to others, you have to have oxygen yourself. If you want to give inspiration to others, you have to be inspired yourself. I draw upon the women who came before us. Yes, my mother, but also all the imahos and all the incredible women in Tanakh. In fact, I, I give a talk and a speech just about that, the koach of the women who came before us, because it's not just ancient history, it's for today. So women have tremendous koach. Now, how to remain tenua with that? Personally, in my own life, just as my mother did, I always ask Das Torah if I have a question. I believe that we all have a spiritual compass inside of us. When something is niggling as if it's not right, pay attention, ask, and don't be embarrassed to ask somebody higher and greater than you. None of us know everything. There has to be somebody that we go to so that we can say, I asked a Shaila, I asked this question, and I'm good with it. And sometimes the answer is no. We have to be macabre. We have to accept that. I've asked plenty of questions in my life. And sometimes I'm so surprised where the rough that I've asked said, definitely, you're invited there. Go for it. So don't assume. But know that you have a spiritual compass. You have what to offer. There's koach of women who came before us. And to the young women of today, there aren't so many role models, unfortunately, for, for young women to see, to look at, to think at. So draw upon the role models that we have. Study their lives. The women of Tanakh give us such a beautiful formula as to how to live. They've all struggled. And the struggles and challenges that they went through is not just so that they could get through their life, but they were creating spiritual DNA for us until today. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, Hannah, Esther, Yehudas, Miriam, there's no end. When you study their lives, you see your own life in it and you become passionate because if they can go through it, then surely I can go through this too. They created spiritual footprints for me. So that's how I, I, I encourage myself and I encourage all the young women who are listening to this today, never give up on your dreams and your hopes, but know that we have a spiritual compass to guide us and to lead us and Das Torah, and then you can accomplish all your dreams. What would you recommend to women at this time of year we're entering the Yom Noraim and uh, women want to feel connected. They want to feel that spirituality, that inspiration. Um, however, many women are very busy with balancing children, balancing family, balancing professions often, and um, and it's hard for them to tap into. What would you recommend? How's the best way for, for women to feel that inspiration to that connection to Hashem during this, this time? And if they can't go to shul, all of that, how would you recommend? It's definitely difficult. I recently had two of my children stay in my home and we had four children, all four and under, and I was trying to daven in the morning and here the mothers were. And I was like, how do you do this girls? <laughs> so it's difficult, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. We don't need perfection. We don't need to be hard on ourselves. We do need not to give ourselves excuses though, how to grow distant from Hashem as the years go by. Too many women allow years to go by without connecting to Hashem. When you stop using a muscle, the muscle atrophies. That's how it is physically and that's how it is spiritually. Speaking to Hashem every single day, to use that spiritual muscle is a must. Whether you just say, I Hashem, I'm trying so hard. That's a tefillah. That's a prayer. Hashem, help me. That's a prayer. That's a tefillah. If you can carve out time for things that are important for you, if you can carve out time for a gym and you can carve out time for a, a coffee and you can carve out time for a jog or whatever it is that you love, you can carve out some moments for tefillah, for connection, 
for learning. There's so much opportunity today, even online. I know you've given a, a tremendous podcast, Rabbi Goldberg, of Parsha every week that infuses. You can go for the run and, and you can hear it at the same time. We really don't have an excuse of not having a little bit of time in our life to grow. And it doesn't have to be for hours. It doesn't have to be a whole day. But I would say that even if it's 10 minutes of davening, 10 minutes of talking to Hashem, turn off your phone for that 10 minutes. Let everyone in the house know this is my time with Hashem. Do you know what an impact that makes on a child to see a, a mother daven like that? It could be 10 minutes, but those 10 minutes are holy and they're sacred. They're important to me. So don't make excuses, but don't make it perfect. Find that time for yourself and you will feel that you are into your yantiv so much, so much greater. I would also say that when you are doing things for yantiv, you go to the store, you're preparing something, you're cooking, you're cleaning, whatever it is that you're doing, ask yourself why I'm doing this. It's not just about making a roast. I'm giving my child a memory of a beautiful yantiv. I'm creating roots so that when the child leaves home, they're going to look back at this time. And sometimes, you know what? It's, it's an aroma. It's a scent. It's a taste that brings a child back to a certain place. Oh, remember when mommy used to make that and we would sit at the table that was Rosh Hashanah, that was mommy's special Rosh Hashanah recipe or special Shabbos recipe. You're creating something great that only you as a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother, as a woman can create. Nobody else can do that for you. And that's beautiful. I, th I think it's such an important message because, um, you know, I speak to colleagues and I know in many communities they're struggling now that for men, there are countless, it seems, outlets to grow religiously. So you can encourage men, come learn early in the morning, come have a chavrus after work at night, come to the tish, the oneg, the lel shishi. There's so many, come fabreng, come. There's so many opportunities to come together. And for women, there's less so. And there are communities like ours and yours and others that try to provide those opportunities. But it's not as much as a movement. And for women who are balanced and getting kids off to school and then bath time and bedtime and homework, which are also a father's responsibility, there's so little energy left at the end. And, and your message that women can also open a safer and find inspiration in it and can go out and participate in a program or a class. But within the home, if, you, if you're mindful and infuse the challah and the soup and the kugel and the yantif and the Shabbos preparation and the 10 minutes of, of modeling, disconnecting from a phone and davening, you don't have to always run out or run elsewhere to find the inspiration. We can create it for men and for women, but for women in particular within the, the home as well. Are there other tips or guidance you have for sometimes, again, couples where, you know, the husband is, is plugged in and invited and participating in so many opportunities. The woman has less energy, less opportunities to be able to do it, what, what she can do to, or even, as you were saying, take responsibility to jumpstart and, and initiate and manufacture her own inspiration instead of waiting for it to come from elsewhere. We wait a lot for, for things to happen. I wait for people to make me happy, right? When I have the power to create my own happiness. Don't, don't wait for your inspiration. What inspires you? Choose one Torah teacher. Choose one safer. Choose one podcast. Put it on while you're cooking. Put it on while you're walking. When you do something with a child, I close my eyes every night when I say Shema. I still hear my father saying Shema with me. Do you know what that is? That's a legacy. So when you are doing something with your child, it doesn't matter how old your child is, even if you have a child who's married and, and you're going out together, you're creating something, you're creating a bond. You can learn with a child too. There's something beautiful that you can do. You are that child's guide. You are that child's inspiration. So figure out what inspires you. Everybody has something else that inspires them. Some people need something visual. Some people like to learn on their own. Some people like to learn with a friend. There are so many outlets today that Hashem has given us in this world of technology where we can use it for good. Carve out a certain amount of time for yourself that's reasonable 
every single day or every single week, share it at your Shabbos table. You have what to offer. Maybe it's a story of Hashgacha Pratis. Something great happened to you this week where you saw Hashem's hand in your life. You know what a lesson that is? Come to your Shabbos table with a story, with something you prepared, something that touched your heart. You will transform your entire table. You have what to offer your family. Beautiful. You, you also, um, you want to jump in? Should we continue about marriage? Because uh, Rebetzin has also written and spoken so much about marriage. We spoke about parenting, role of women, family legacy. But marriage, what, what, what are you seeing today on the state of marriage today? And, and why do you think the challenges that exist exist? And what do you think are some of the solutions of what we could all be doing better? There's a lot of sadness today in marriage, unfortunately. Of course, there's a lot of good and beautiful couples, but there's also a lot of challenges that I've seen and I continue to see. I think that, in my humble opinion, much comes from social media where there's a lot of comparative living. And it feels as if everybody else is in the south of France right now or <laughs> dancing. And their kids are so perfect. Their house, their kitchen, their husband bought them this piece of jewelry. Their wife is just always preparing gourmet meals for, for dinner. And what do we have? When you live like that, you can never be happy. You're always miserable. It eats away at the fabric, the very fabric of your relationship, of your marriage. You can't appreciate anything because you're so busy looking at everybody else's blessing that you never see your own. And you think to yourself that you come up short. So you're miserable when you could be so happy. That's, that's one thing. The other thing I, I believe, the other factor in challenges in marriages, our phones, our devices, our laptops. We we sit together in a, in a room, but I call it being alone together. You could be together with your entire family, but everyone is into their own device. Husband and wife could be at a table. They're walking. How many times do you see a couple at a restaurant? They're just, they're not looking at each other. They're not talking to each other. They're just looking at their phones. You go for a walk. How many times do you see couples walking together, but they're on their phones? There is such a disconnect between couples. When you're not able to talk and communicate and look into each somebody's eyes, you lose a big chunk of love. And the third thing I would say is we take each other for granted. So the question is, I pose this to couples all the time. How do I want what I have already? I wanted the shidduch. I did anything to get married, right? I went to this makobo and that makobo. I went to a muka. I, I went to this wedding and that wedding. I put myself out there. And then you have it. You walk down the chuppah, but that's not the goal. That's just the start. Now, how do you appreciate and work on what you have? You have it already. So human nature is such that when you have something, you stop appreciating it. Those are both great pieces of advice. I think everybody could work on that. Even the, even strong marriages can become even stronger, even stronger from there. And I think um, we're not necessarily teaching young people to be able to come into relationships and marriage with those with that presence and that mindfulness from early on. And because preparing for marriage happens with how you get along with your siblings and your parents and your roommates and do you make space and can you be present and are you communicating and can you be vulnerable? And if that's all not solidified and strong, it's not going to happen or change overnight just because you stand under a chuppah. There's a chapter in my book that I wrote because I saw so many couples running into trouble. Then I wondered, is there anything that we can do to give our children now tools so that they can come into a relationship and they can be strong? Why, why are so many young couples giving up so easily? What's happening? When we try to fix everything, that's just one example for children, then when they run into trouble, 
they don't know how to handle it because mommy and daddy fixed it all. Either we took them out of the situation, we wrote an excuse note, we found resolution ourselves. We don't allow our children to feel stress. So if there's a little stress in a marriage right away, it's like, oh my gosh, I, it's over. We don't know how to fix it ourselves. We can't expect mommy and daddy to fix everything all the time. That's not real life. We have to allow children to sometimes feel what it means to struggle, to sweat, to fix, to climb a mountain, to fall down and then stand up. How would you ever know what success feels like if you've never tasted failure? Mm. So we keep giving and giving or buying and buying, but that's not going to be the solution for a good life. So what's so the best advice? This. What's the best advice to parents to help their kids? Like you, I, what I've gotten from this conversation, which I, I'm finding so inspiring, is that you're telling people the way that you could have a meaningful life is to empower yourself to, to make everything that you do infused with meaning. Like, I love what you said about when you cook and when you're baking and the meaning behind what that means to your family, what that could, could mean to your guests, um, you know, and, and everything you're doing with a purpose. And that makes you feel so complete and so wonderful. And that's something that this generation, I feel like, is really struggling with. What could parents do to help their kid already from the beginning? You say to give them those tips, to give them that wherewithal, to have that ability. What practically could we do to help our kids just find meaning in every day, find meaning in the little things, not always need like instant gratification, but just enjoy going through the motions, enjoy the process. How, how can we help them with that? So we don't have to reward them all the time with things. You know, it's so, we're so fast to do that. You do that, we're going to go buy you a treat, right? There's a way that you can give a child a feeling of meaning by giving a child an identity. Now, how do we do that? I write about this in the book too. When you want to give a child confidence, the mistake that we make is we often say things like, wow, you're amazing. You're awesome. Daddy, did you just see what she did? Oh my gosh, that's the most gorgeous, the most beautiful. But what happens that same child that goes to school and now there's 22 or 24 other wow amazing kids there that the teacher sees is they're you know they're my kids i'm going to teach them but no one is amazing what makes a child amazing so now as a parent i need to have an identity for this child how do i do that when I recognize something that this child does, I put a name on it. So I will say responsible, kind. That was so kind of you that you took care of your sister like that. I know it was very hard for you not to hit your, your brother when he started up with you. That was really self-control. What a gibber you are. Think of different words that you could use with your children, not prizes, not treats, not amazing, awesome, fantastic, the best, but real identity markers where you are nurturing a child in a shama. You're nurturing a child's soul. You're teaching a child their potential. This is who you are. This is what you can be. You're able to do this. You got this. Even though you fell, you got up again. That was so brave of you not in an exaggerating way or an unreal way, but every child has a magic. Every child is unique in a certain way. My job as a mother, as a father, is to find that uniqueness, to zero in on it, and then help the child discover what he or she is capable of. If I'm able to do that, then I can raise a child to be resilient, to have grit, to believe in himself or herself. It's not the jacket that I'm wearing and the brand that's, that's on the sleeve that's giving me my identity. Because once I lose that jacket, who am I? I've lost myself. You can't raise children based on things. Things will not create identity or create happiness. I always want to go then to the next thing or someone else has something better. Then who am I? Our children have lost their identity. They become crushed so easily. 
but there's so much magic inside. There's so much potential inside. Let's not lose it. It's great advice. Rebetzin, thank you for going behind the bin, giving us this time. I want to end with one last question. We're in the month of Elul. Yes. So people hear that word Elul, and we know we have a tradition years past and seems no longer. When people heard the word Elul, the walls, they would tremble, would shake. Elul enough was uh, able to instill a... Uh, an awesome sense. What does the word Elul mean for you? When you hear the word Elul, from the time that we bench Rosh Chodesh Elul, as we're now marching through Elul and counting towards Rosh Hashanah, what are some Elul thoughts, some Elul exercises, not to wake up on Erev Rosh Hashanah and say, I don't know where Elul went, I'm not ready, but how do we take advantage of Elul? It's a big question. You, my father was one who would say to me, when, when I used to hear Elul in, in Hungary, they would say Rosh Chodesh Elul and people around me would faint. Nobody's fainting in shul these days when you say Elul. But it is a time of introspection for sure. So I would say that we should each, and I'm talking to myself now, whenever I come to Elul, I, I ask myself, I'm being very vulnerable right now. I ask myself how I have changed this past year from the years before. Because if I'm the same person, then what's my life all about? Life is about growth. And I need to figure out where I need to grow, to be honest with myself, to try to choose one thing. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be something like once a day when I'm about to lose my temper, I will zip my mouth. But by the end of the month, that's 30 times. By the end of the year, that's... 365 less times that I I lost it or I screamed at somebody or I said something that I'm not proud of or done something. So even if it's once a day, I, I want to figure out what's my trigger, what's something that I can do, doable, manageable. So I look at a chauffeur and I think to myself, number one, that the shape of the chauffeur gives me the message for Elo. And the shape is bent. It's, it's time to bend a little, bit, a little bit, to be a little bit humble and not get lost in our excuses, to really ask ourselves, Ayeka, where am I? Where am I as a human being? I ask myself this question. Where am I in my relationships in my life, personally, with others around me, with community, and with my God? What's my relationship with my God looking like? And then I think about, too, how we blow the chauffeur from the smaller hole, not from the larger. And that's, that's the halacha. That's the Jewish law. Why? Because if I just take one little breath that Hashem has given me and I blow it back, then Hashem could make and create something so great from just my little effort and my little soul that I have. I'm just one person. You're just one person. But if you take that breath that Hashem gave you and you blow it back and say, I'm going to make a difference in this world, then Hashem takes your lead and you can accomplish and do anything. Wow, what a beautiful thought. And as a Baal Tokei, I appreciate that. You gave me a kavana, an extra thought to have this year when blowing that show for what an image, what an amazing image. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for your books. Thank you for your lectures. And thank you for joining us behind the bima. I wish you a ksiva v'chasima tova. It should be a good year for all of us. Thank you. What an honor and privilege it is. And I wish you both mazel and bracha and a year filled with hatzlacha as you continue to inspire so many and you're a role model for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great conversation. She is amazingly impressive in her thoughts being organized, her ability to articulate them and to share them and they're very deep and profound. And I'm so grateful that she made herself a bit vulnerable talking about her family and her childhood and potentially growing up in the shadow of her mother and there was a lot to think about. For me, as a Baltokea, that image of the chauffeur that we put in a little breath on one end and it can come out as a great sound on the other. A little bit of effort can make a big difference or one person can produce a great sound. And I love that image. It's something I'm carrying with me into Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, I agree. I think she gives great lessons on how to approach Elul, how to approach this time of year. And I loved her perspective on women and what women could do to infuse their 
you know, their daily life with meaning, you know, bring meaning into the mundane. When you're watching your kids have kavana, you know, that they should have a good year. When you're making, preparing your, your suda for Rosh Hashanah, you know, infuse the food with that kavana of, you know, everyone should just be healthy and this food should, you know, bring everyone together at the suda. Whatever it is, everything could have those kavanas behind it and then everything you're doing is is spiritual and it's growth oriented Absolutely. and it's really all about just bringing that that meaning and that purpose into your lives and i just love all of her tips on parenting and and marriage and relationships it was it was really a great conversation i have so much respect and regard for her i think there's so it's so hard to find women these days who are comfortable in the public eye like this who are able to give over their message in in a way that um is so grounded in in such values, you know, the way she grew up and now is bringing that into this next generation that we could all learn from her and that she's putting herself out there with these books that she's writing and with her speaking engagements. And she's so, she's always so impressive and, and speaks so beautifully that I feel so inspired by her. And I'm sure everyone who watches this episode will love it. And she should just yep. continue her great work. Amen. And inspired by you. Anyone who thinks that Yochevet is a great guest co-host, maybe she should come on more often let us know, put it in the comments or send an email and maybe you can help convince her what I've been unable to, that she should do this more regularly because there's so much to offer. So Yechavit, thank you for uh, co-hosting and much more than that, but thank you for co-hosting tonight. And until next time, we tell everybody, stay happy, stay healthy and stay healthy. Have a great night. Stay holy. <laughs> stay holy.